Part 6, Chapter 3 The Ranks of Exile Thicken Only the peasants were deported so ferociously to such desolate places with such frankly murderous intent. No one had been exiled in this way before, and no one would be in the future. Yet in another sense, and in its own steady way, the world of exiles grew denser and darker from year to year. More were banished. They were never settled more thickly. The rules became more severe. We could offer the following rough time scheme. In the twenties, exile was a sort of preparatory stage, a way station before imprisonment in a camp. For very few did it all end with exile. Nearly all later were raked into the camps. From the mid-thirties, and especially from Beria's time, perhaps because the world of exile became so populous, think of how many Leningrad alone contributed, it acquired a completely independent significance as a totally satisfactory form of restriction and isolation. In the war and post-war years, the exile system steadily grew in capacity and importance together with the camps. It required no expenditure on the construction of huts and boundary fences, on guards and warders, and there was room in its capacious embrace for big batches, especially those including women and children. At all major transit prisons, cells were kept permanently available for women and children, and they were never empty. Exile made possible a speedy, reliable, and irreversible cleansing of any important region in the mainland. The exile system established itself so firmly that from 1948 it acquired yet another function of importance to the state, that of rubbish dump or drainage pool where the waste products of the archipelago were tipped so that they would never make their way back to the mainland. In spring 1948, this instruction was passed down to the camps. At the end of their sentences, 58s, with minor exceptions, were to be released into exile. In other words, they were not to be thoughtlessly unleashed on a country which did not belong to them. But each individual was to be delivered under escort from the camp guardhouse to the commandant's office in an exile colony, from fish trap to fish trap. Since the exile system embraced only certain strictly defined areas, these together constituted yet another separate, though interlocking, country between the USSR and the archipelago, a sort of purgatory in reverse, from which a man could cross to the archipelago, but not to the mainland. The years 1944 to 1945 brought to the exile colonies unusually heavy reinforcements from the liberated, occupied, territories, and 1947 to 1949 yet others from the Western republics. All these streams together, even without the exiled peasants, exceeded many times over the figure of 500,000 exiles, which was all that Tsarist Russia the prison house of nations, could muster in the whole course of the nineteenth century. For what crimes was a citizen of our country in the thirties and forties punishable by exile or banishment? The commonest crimes can be easily indicated. 1. Belonging to a criminal nationality. For this, see the next chapter. 2. A previous term of imprisonment in the camps. 3. Residence in a criminal environment seditious Leningrad, or areas in which there are partisan movement, such as the western Ukraine or the Baltic states. And then many tributaries enumerated at the very beginning of this book branched out to feed the exile system as well as the camps, continually casting up some of their burden on the shores of exile. We cannot go into the different types and cases of exile, because all our knowledge of it derives from casual stories or letters. If A. M. Arv had not written his letter, the reader would not have the following story. In 1943, news came to a village around Vyatka that one of its Kolka's peasants, Kazurin, a private in the infantry, had either been sent to a punitive unit or shot outright. His wife, who had six children, the oldest was ten years, the youngest six months old, and two sisters of hers, spinsters nearing fifty, also lived with her was immediately visited by the executants. You already know the word, reader. It is a euphemism for executioners. 
They gave the family no time to sell anything. Their house, cow, sheep, hay, wood, were all abandoned to the pilferers, threw all nine of them with their smaller possessions onto a sledge, and took them sixty kilometers to a hard frost to the town of Vyatka, Kirov. Why did they not freeze on the way, God only knows. They were kept for six weeks at the Kirov transit prison, then sent to a small pottery near Ukata. The spinster sisters ate from rubbish heaps, both went mad and both died. The mother and children stayed alive only thanks to the help, the politically ignorant, unpatriotic, in fact anti-Soviet help, of the local population. The sons all served in the army when they grew up and are said to have completed their military and political training with distinction. Their mother returned to her native village in 1960 and found not a single log, not a single brick from the stove, where her house had been. A little cameo like this can surely be threaded onto the necklace of our great fatherland victory, but nobody will touch it. It isn't typical. To what necklace will you add, to what category of exiles will you assign soldiers disabled in the fatherland war and exiled because of it? We know almost nothing about them. They were exiled to a certain northern island, exiled because they had consented to be mutilated in war for the glory of the fatherland and in order to improve the health of a nation, which had by now won such victories in all forms of athletics and ball games. These luckless war heroes are held there on their unknown island, naturally without the right to correspond with the mainland, a very few letters break through, and this is how we know about it, and naturally on the meager rations, because they cannot work hard enough to warrant generosity. I believe they are still living out their days there. End of Part 6, Chapter 3